Okay, so we are talking about chapter 8 today, which is the appendicular skeleton. So the appendicular skeleton is 126 bones, the left side and the right side. It includes the pectoral girdle and the upper limbs and the pelvic girdle and the lower limbs. So the girdles are what attach the limbs to the axial skeleton. It's primarily concerned with movement as far as function goes. And if you look at the picture on the side, the appendicular skeleton is now highlighted in blue. So the pectoral girdle, girdle is the shoulder girdle. It includes the clavicle, which is commonly referred to as the collarbone, the scapula, which is commonly called the shoulder blade, and also incorporates the head of the humerus. The clavicle is S-shaped. The medial end articulates with the manubrium of the sternum, and it forms the sternoclavicular joint. The lateral end articulates with the acromion of the scapula, and it forms the acromioclavicular joint. And oftentimes, if you have a separated shoulder, this is what it is referring to. The scapula, the shoulder blade, has the spine, which is the posterior of the scapula. It runs horizontally. As you can see in the picture, it is color coordinated with the word and the arrow. So that one's in red. The acromion in green is the flattened lateral portion of the spine, and that articulates with the lateral end of the clavicle. The coracoid process is the protruding projection on the anterior surface, and this is an attachment for tendons and ligaments. And be careful because we're also going to be talking about the coronoid process and fossa later. So this is the coracoid process with the C. And then the glenoid cavity in purple is the shallow concaveness that articulates with the head of the humerus. When you look at it, it is not very deep at all. It's very shallow, and the humerus kind of just sits in there, which is why it's really easy to dislocate it right there. The upper limb, you have the shoulder region where it's attached to the trunk. Again, shoulder dislocations are common. The arm is the upper limb between the shoulder and the elbow joint, which is the humerus for the bone. The forearm is between the elbow and the wrist, and this is made up of the radius on the lateral portion and the ulna on the medial portion, and then the hand, which is distal to the wrist and is made up of the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. The humerus is the arm bone. The proximal end, or the head, articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula, and the distal end articulates with the radius and the ulna to form the elbow. Landmarks, the tubercules, you have the greater, sorry, greater, which is more lateral, and the lesser, which is more anterior. And those, again, are rounded projections. The intertubercular sulcus is the groove between these two tubercules, and that's where the biceps head is located. The deltoid tuberosity, the epicondyles, which you have the lateral and the medial, and then the condyles. You have the capitulum, which is the lateral condyle. It's proximal to the head of the humerus. And the trochlea, which is the medial condyle, and it's proximal to the ulna. And if you look at them, they're kind of shaped like a, a tie almost, a bow tie almost. And the trochlea is kind of the more flattened end. So if you think of a T for trochlea, is the kind of more flattened end as opposed to the rounded capitulum. The ulna nerve goes through the medial epicondyle, and this is when you hit your funny bone. That's where the tingling sensation comes from. The neck supports the head, and you have the anatomical versus the surgical necks, and those are rounded over on the picture to the side. And then you have the fossa, which are shallow depressions. The radial fossa, which is in red, is where the radius articulates, and the coronoid fossa which is where the ulna coronoid process articulates. And then you have the olecranon fossa on the posterior portion. And this is where the olecranon, which is the top portion of the ulna, articulates. So again, the coracoid is on the shoulder, the scapula. The coronoid is here in the, in the upper arm, the limb, sorry. So the radius is the lateral, your thumb side of your forearm. The ulna is your medial or your pinky side of your forearm. 
The radial and ulna diaphyses are connected by what's called an interosseous membrane. So that interosseous membrane you can see is like a meshwork that connects those two bones. So it kind of limits the movement there a little bit. The radial ulnar joints, you know, approximately the radius head articulates with the ulna, and then distally the ulnar head articulates with the radius. And you can see those are color coded as well. So the radius, the radius head is the proximal portion. The radial tuberosity is right below that, and that attaches the biceps. And then the radius styloid or the styloid process. You have the lateral and the distal end. So it's kind of on the outside, further away from the point of origin, so further away from the shoulder. And it kind of points down a little bit. On the ulna, you have the olecranon, which is the posterior side. You have the trochlear notch, which is that inside of the C. If you look at the ulna, it kind of looks like a C. So that inside of the C is the trochlear notch, and that's where the trochlea sits. And then the coronoid process and the radial notch. So the radial notch is where the radius sits. And then that coronoid process is what goes into or articulates with the coronoid fossa. Distally speaking, you have the styloid process and the ulnar head. So if you look at the styloid process again, it's on the medial side and that kind of sticks down a little bit as well. So here's a picture of the elbow basically. So you can see how the humerus and the forearm, the radius and the ulna articulate with each other. And then you can see all of those things labeled that we just went over. So make sure you look through it so that you kind of understand how the elbow works. The hand is the wrist, the palm, and the fingers. So the wrist are the carpals. You have eight carpal bones arranged in two rows. The palm is the metacarpus. You have five metacarpal bones labeled one through five. Each one has a base, a shaft, and a head, which are your knuckles. And then the fingers, you have three phalanges except for the thumb. So you have a proximal, middle, and distal on all of the phalanges except for the thumb. And again, labeled one through five from lateral to medial. Make sure you go over those um, carpal bones as well. So the pelvic girdle connects the bones of the lower limb to the axial skeleton and also provides support for the pelvis and vertebral column and protection for those lower abdominal or the pelvic organs. It's made up of two coxal or hip bones. They articulate posteriorly at the sacro sacroiliac joints, which is with the sacrum, of course, and anteriorly with the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis is made up of fibrocartilage. So again, that's the strongest cartilage that we have in our body. And it kind of relaxes a little bit when women give birth. Each coxal bone consists of three bones that are fused together. Superiorly, it's the ilium. Inferiorly and posteriorly is the ischium. And then the pubis is the inferior anterior bone. So you can see on the side picture there, you have the ilium on top and then the ischium and pubis beneath it. The acetabulum is the socket for the femoral head. So that's where your femur rests. Notice how deep that is. So that's why it's a lot harder to dislocate your leg from your hip than it is your arm from your shoulder. And then the obturator foramen is that opening there. And that's very important for a lot of the nerves and blood vessels to run through. The largest of the three bones is the ilium. The iliac crest is that superior lateral marking that you can see. The greater sciatic notch is that like V indentation. This is where your sciatic nerve passes. So if you ever have sciatica, you have pain in your lower back, upper leg, it's probably because your greater sciatic or your sciatic nerve is pinched and it travels through this greater sciatic notch. And then the anterior superior marking is the iliac spine. The ischial tuberosity is the most prominent feature, and you can see it's on the bottom. And 
that is basically what we sit on when we're sitting down. The pelvic brim is that inlet, and it's from the sacral promontory to the upper part of the pubic symphysis. And then the false pelvis is superior to the pelvic brim. This has the lower intestines, the urinary bladder when it's full, uterus, ovaries, and uterine tubes in females. So you have what's called your false pelvis, which is basically from hip bone to hip bone. And then you have your true pelvis, which is where a baby that's being born is actually can pass through. As I just said, so your true pelvis is inferior to the pelvic brim right below it. It has the bladder, the vagina, and the cervix in females and holds the prostate in males. So there's your pulse pelvis versus your true pelvis. So false pelvis is basically from hip bone to hip bone. True pelvis is the actual opening. Some differences between males and females. Female pelvis is lighter, it's thinner, it's more shallow, but it's wider. And that's of course to accommodate a fetus growing. And then the male is heavier and thicker. It's more narrow, but deeper. If you look at that pubic arch on the bottom of each one, in females, it's greater than 90 degrees, and in males, it's less than 90 degrees. And that's actually the fastest way to tell the difference between a male and a female pelvis, if you look at that pubic arch. The lower limb, you have the gluteal region, which is between the iliac crest and the hip joint, the thigh between the hip and the knee joint, which has your femur, the leg between the knee and the ankle, which has your tibia and fibula, and the foot, which is distal to the ankle and is made up of the tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. So the femur is your thigh bone. It's the longest, heaviest, and strongest bone in our body. The proximal end is the head, and the acetabulum of the hip bone, bone sorry, form the coxal joint. So the head of the femur goes right into that acetabulum. And distally speaking, you have the medial and lateral femoral condyles that articulate with the tibia, not the fibula, and form the knee joint. It's very important to note the knee joint. The tibia is the bone that forms the knee joint. The fibula is off to the side. It's the smaller, thinner bone of the two. It also articulates with the patella. So the head, you have the fovea capitis, where the ligament connects the head to the acetabulum. The neck is the very common site of a fracture. So oftentimes, if somebody says you have a broken hip, that's the part that breaks. You can get artificial replacements as well. And then you have the greater and lesser trochanters. The greater is superior, the lesser is inferior. And again, they're color-coded. The epicondyles, you have the medial and the lateral. This is where your knee muscles attach, and they're on the posterior side that you can really see them. And the condyles articulate with the tibia. So if you look at the anterior view, you can see those there. The patella is the kneecap. This is the only named sesamoid bone, and it's the largest, of course. The posterior surface has thick articular cartilage, and the patellofemoral joint is a common injury for if you're a runner or play sports, really. So you have these tendons and ligaments that really try to stabilize that knee, but since it's obviously movable, highly movable, and has a lot of pressure, it's a very common part of point of injury. Two bones make the leg, the tibia, and the fibula. So the tibia is medial, the fibula is lateral. The tibia is the largest, and that bears all of the weight. The fibula stabilizes the ankle joint. So the proximal end, you have the tibiofemoral joint, or your knee joint. The lateral and medial tibial condyles articulate with the lateral and medial femur condyles. And then the tibiofibular joint is the tibia and the head of the fibula. The distal end, the fibula stabilizes, and the tibia of the talus, which is part of your ankle tarsals, and then the tibiofibular joint, your tibia and your fibula again. So you have the tibia and the fibula both 
in contact at the proximal end and the distal end, forming that joint. But then the tibia really bears most of the weight, and the fibula more acts as a stabilizer. Tibia is commonly referred to as your shin bone. The tibial tuberosity is where the patellar ligament attaches. And we'll talk about your knee joint when we get to chapter 9, with when we talk about articulations. The medial malleolus articulates with the talus, and that is your inner, what we commonly refer to as your ankle, where it protrudes out there. And the fibula has the lateral malleolus, which articulates with the tibia and the talus at the ankle. So again, your outer ankle joint, which we commonly refer to, the outer protrusion there. So the tibia and the fibula, just like the radius and the ulna, are attached by that interosseous membrane. So again, it helps kind of stabilize it a little bit and helps prevent movement between those two bones, excessive movement between those two bones, that is. The ankle is made up of seven tarsal bones. So again, just like the carpals, the wrist bones, familiarize yourself with these tarsal bones. The calcaneus is the heel. That's the largest and the strongest. And the talus is what articulates with the tibia and the fibula. So make sure you go through those seven tarsal bones. If you have any questions, make sure you ask. And make sure you go over the carpal bones and, again, ask questions. The metatarsals, five bones, one to five, just like the metacarpals. These form the arches. And then the phalanges, three bones each, just like on your hands the proximal, middle, and distal, except for the big toe, the hallux, that only has the proximal and the distal. Make sure you read the homeostatic imbalances and medical terminology in your book. But again, there isn't a whole lot of new things really here because we've been covering bones for a little bit now. So make sure, of course, osteoporosis is a big one and fractures because when we age, our bone starts to become more porous, it starts to weaken. 